In the previous couple of videos, we've been discussing how numbers are represented on a computer and how that produces round off error and how the condition number can be used to diagnose how much of an effect that round off error may have on our system of equations and getting its solution. So here we're going to look at an alternative to the condition number as well as look at the Hilbert matrix as an example of a very ill-conditioned matrix and the consequences that it has on its solution. So although the condition number is indeed a very definitive measure of the conditioning of a matrix, it tells us a lot of information. Remember we showed how it can even tell us how many decimal places of accuracy we expect to lose when we, for example, invert a matrix. But it requires a lot of computation, so we have to get the full spectrum of eigenvalues or singular values of a matrix in order to check the condition number and that amount of computation is on par with solving the system of equations that we're seeking. So as a diagnostic, it's, it's a lot of extra computation. So I want to discuss an alternative, and that is to test for diagonal dominance. It's a very straightforward test. You can often see visually whether it's a matrix is diagonally dominant. And it's exactly what it sounds like. So diagonal dominance simply requires that the sum of the magnitudes of the off-diagonal elements be no greater than that of the main diagonal element. So this is a row by row test. So every row has to be diagonally dominant in order for the matrix itself to be diagonally dominant. So here's the test. So AII magnitude, so it's absolute value. So that's A11, 223344 down the main diagonal of the matrix. That has to be at least as large as the sum of all the off di diagonal elements in that row. So all the other elements other than the main diagonal element sum up their magnitudes, and that has to be no greater than that of the main diagonal element. If it's a greater than sign, so if the main diagonal element is larger than the sum of the magnitudes of the others, then we say that it is strictly or strongly diagonally dominant. If the equal sign applies, so it's the same as that sum, then we say it's weakly diagonally dominant. Now what we can do is we can prove, I won't go through the proof, but we can prove that if it is strictly diagonally dominant, then these three things are true. The second one isn't terribly important for our discussion right now, so I won't emphasize it here. The first is that if it is strictly diagonally dominant, then A is non-singular, and therefore it is invertible. So its determinant is not equal to zero, it is invertible, and we can get a unique solution. The third is that, and this is the one that's important for our considerations right here, computations are stable with respect to round off errors. So remember these round off errors are inevitably present in these computations on digital computers. And the question is what happens to those round off errors? Do they grow? Do they not grow? So what this tells us, and this results from a mathematical proof, these computations are indeed stable. So I can take inverses of A, I can do operations on A, and those will be stable, numerically stable, with respect to these round off errors. Now if it's only weakly diagonally dominant, then those things are normally true in practice, but we can't prove that they have to be true. So usually in practice, weak diagonal dominance is sufficient for these properties that we want, but they could only be proven for the case where it's strictly diagonally dominant. So again, it doesn't give us any more information than the condition number. In, in fact, it doesn't tell us how much of an effect on in terms of loss of accuracy we're going to experience, as is the case with a condition number. But it's a much simpler test, and it's the test that we'll be using throughout the remainder of the videos for the most part. Let me make a few comments about this relative to the condition number. In both cases, they are addressing how mathematically amenable a particular system is to solutions. So an A, U is equal to B. We want to know how likely is it that we will get a good, accurate solution of that system of linear algebraic equations. It's not addressing the algorithm to get that solution. It's not addressing the numerical stability of that algorithm. It's just looking at the system of equations by itself, and this is a mathematical property of that system. So the additional question of numerical stability, which still is related to these round off errors, because that's what instigates the numerical instability, that is a separate question, that is a separate issue that we're going to have to address later on when we get to situations where numerical stability could arise. So we'll address that in a later video. So the way to think about this is that the conditioning is a mathematical property of the algebraic system, as I said. So this is really looking at step three of our numerical solution procedures. Remember, that's taking 
the linear system of algebraic equations that we want to solve and looking at how we solve it and whether those solutions are accurate. Step two in the numerical solution procedure, which is the numerical method that produces that linear system of equations from the continuous differential equations, that gives rise to this issue of numerical stability. They're both related in the sense that they're instigated by these round off errors but they're addressing two separate aspects of our new numerical solution procedure. The key is that any decision I make in that numerical solution procedure in steps one, two, or three, those result in the A, the A matrix that I get in that third step that I need to solve A U is equal to B. So any decision I make that affects the A ultimately influences the condition number, diagonal dominance, and so forth. So it will have an effect on how the solution is obtained and whether it's accurate or not. Now, as I said at the outset, what I'd like to do for the remainder of the video is look at the Hilbert matrix. It's a very simple looking matrix. It turns out to be very ill-conditioned, and it's a great matrix to illustrate the effects of that ill-conditioning. So here is the Hilbert matrix. This is a 10 by 10 version. So you can see it's one, a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, all the way down to, for the 10 by 10 version, 1 19th in the lower right-hand corner. Simple looking matrix, very easy to build in MATLAB and Mathematica, and I would encourage you to do this. It's good practice in MATLAB, Mathematica, Python, or whatever you want to use, and it's a good one to test and play with. You can try different sizes of Hilbert matrices and run through the same things that I'm going to do here. Now the first thing you'll notice is the matrix is symmetric, but it is not diagonally dominant. So if you just pick any one of these rows, uh, you can see that it is not diagonally dominant. So we would expect from that point of view to have issues trying to invert this Hilbert matrix and, and so on. But we're going to use the condition number in addition to quantify how inaccurate those processes may be and test whether that is the case. Okay, so the first diagnostic that we talked about in the last video was the determinant. So if we're trying to solve an AU equals B, the first thing I check is the determinant of A to determine whether it's singular or not. So for our 10 by 10 Hilbert matrix, I used Mathematica here, and the great thing about Mathematica is it does do infinite precision arithmetic. So when I ask for the determinant of a 10 by 10 Hilbert matrix, where I put in rational numbers, not decimals, but rational numbers for each of the entries, it will say, oh, okay, Kevin, you want to get the exact value of the determinant, and this is what it'll give you, one over whatever number this is, this huge number. So it's not zero is the exact determinant of this 10 by 10 Hilbert matrix. So it's not equal to zero, but it's certainly very, very small. In fact, it's much less than zero in a machine precision sense. Remember, 10 to the minus 16 is as small an increment that you can get in double precision on a digital computer. So the Hilbert matrix is very nearly singular. It's not singular. We can get the inverse, and we will. I'll show you that in a moment but it's very, very nearly singular. So we would expect it to be ill-conditioned. So let's look at the condition number and see if that is indeed the case. And the reason we want to look at the condition number is remember, we can't really trust the determinant on this. I don't know how small is too small. And the fact that I get something that's so tiny, is it really supposed to be zero? I only know because I used exact arithmetic and Mathematica that this is the, the correct value of the determinant. If I had done this numerically, I, I can't be sure that that's really a non-zero determinant. So looking at the condition number, remembering that this is a symmetric matrix, we can use the eigenvalues of the Hilbert matrix. The largest one by magnitude is 1.75, and the smallest one by magnitude is 1.09 times 10 to the minus 13. Now remember the condition number is the ratio of the largest to the smallest. This one's order one, but this one is very, very small. So you divide by the very, very small number, and you get that the condition number is 1.6 times 10 to the 13. So this is just like the determinant, where, which was very, very small. This is obviously a very, very large number, but it's not infinite. So it's not a singular matrix. So the question is, is this ill-conditioned? Is this bad from us getting the solution point of view or not? So I'll save you the suspense. This is indeed a very ill-conditioned matrix, and you'll see the consequences that in a moment. So first of all, let's use that condition number that we just obtained to estimate the number of digits of accuracy that we expect to lose. Remember, if you take the log base 10 of the condition number, you get an estimate for the number of digits that you expect to lose. We start with 16 in double precision. 
we expect to lose about 13 of those 16 digits, so that it only leaves three left. So when I, for example, which is what we'll do here, take the inverse of the Hilbert matrix, I expect the answer that I get to only be accurate to about three significant figures. So again, I've done all of this in Mathematica. You'll get similar results in Python or, or MATLAB. So what I'm going to do is evaluate the inverse of my 10 by 10 Hilbert matrix, and then I will multiply those two together. If I take a matrix times its inverse, I should get the identity matrix. One's down the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. That's if I use exact arithmetic and if I have an exact representation of the inverse of a matrix. If I get the inverse numerically, which is what I've done here, I've forced Mathematica to do that, even though it can get the exact inverse, I've told it to get the inverse using double precision arithmetic. So let's take a look at the result I get. Instead of getting ones and zeros exactly, these are the values along the main diagonal. And I've not included all 16 decimal places of accuracy. So you can see here it's 1.00002, 0001, 0.999912. But what you'll notice is these are only good to three decimal places of accuracy. That's exactly what we expected. I expected to lose of the 16, to lose 13, leaving me with roughly three digits of accuracy. And that's exactly what we have. The zeros on the off diagonals, the zeros are comparable. So they are zeros, but only to roughly three decimal places of accuracy. So that's quite a loss in accuracy. Uh, and so again, we say the Hilbert matrix is ill-conditioned. So again, I'd encourage you to play with this. Take a look at what happens when you try different size Hilbert matrices, try different operations such as inverses, getting solutions of AU equals B, and things like that. So finally, just to summarize, the reason for the inaccuracies that we get in taking this inverse is because of the round off errors in the calculations that are required to get the inverse of a matrix and then do the matrix multiplication. So it's those round off errors that are building up that are producing these errors.